Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Kollegen, liebe Freunde, Studierende, Sie erwarten heute hier Karl-Heinz Kohl, der ist leider verhindert, sodass ich eingesprungen bin und mir die schöne Aufgabe zukommt, äh, Frau Lutgehaus, Professor Lutgehaus aus Südkalifornien, das hier vorzustellen. Nancy Lutgehaus ist Professorin für Anthropology, Gender Studies und Political Science an der University of Southern California. Sie war eine Studentin von Margaret Mead und sie war auch zwei Jahre lang Mitarbeiterin von Margaret Mead am American Museum of Natural History, das ist dieser schöne große Bau am Central Park. Sie hat 1975 ihre Magisterarbeit geschrieben, 1985 ihren PhD bei der Columbia University gemacht und unterrichtet seit diesem Jahr, seit 1985, an der University of Southern California. Ihre Feldforschung führte sie nach Neuguinea und man denkt zunächst einmal, wenn man bei Margaret Mead oder mit Margaret Mead zu tun hatte, dann ist es nicht so überraschend. Aber sie hat mir erzählt, es hätte mehr mit Maurice Gondelier zu tun und der damaligen Begeisterung für die Verbindung von Marxismus und Strukturalismus als unbedingt mit Margaret Mead. Sie hat an zwei Orten in Neuguinea Feldforschung gemacht, auf einer Insel namens Manam, die liegt vor der Nordküste, und dann kürzere Einsätze, die mit der Weltbank zu tun hatten, bei den Enga, das ist im Hochland Mount Haye. Und sie hat später noch kürzere Feldforschungsaufenthalte in Kenia gehabt, in der Hauptstadt Nairobi und in einer anderen Stadt im Hochland in Eldorado. Frau Lüttgehaus ist die Autorin bzw. Mitherausgeberin von fünf Büchern und zahllosen Artikeln. Und ich möchte den neuesten ihrer Artikel herausgreifen, der jetzt gerade, also dieser Tage, in Pacific Arts äh, erschienen ist weil mir der Untertitel so außerordentlich gut gefiel. Er heißt Bodily Transformations und der schöne Untertitel heißt Politics and Art of Rias Fire in Gendered Moments in Manam Ethnography, das 1995 erschienen ist. Und ihr jüngstes Buch heißt Margaret Mead, The Making of an American Icon, im Jahre 2008 erschienen bei Princeton University Press. Das Buch über Margaret Mead ist keine Biografie und, wie sie betont, schon gar keine Hagiographie. Es ist der Versuch, einen ethnologischen Blick auf eine Kulturheroin zu werfen und sich zu fragen, warum hat sich Amerika im 20. Jahrhundert so faszinieren lassen von dieser Frau und warum hat es sich so interessiert für die Auskünfte, die Margaret Mead gegeben hat, an Amerika, die sie aus ihrer Feldforschung gewonnen hat. Das ist die Fragestellung, die sie lösen möchte. Wenn Sie zufälligerweise diese Publikationen nicht kennen sollten, dann kennen Sie aber ein, mit Sicherheit ein anderes Werk, mit dem sich der Name äh, unserer Referentin verbindet. Sie war die ethnologische Beraterin des Films Avatar. Zu ihren Forschungsschwerpunkten zählt neben politischer Ethnologie und Wirtschaftsethnologie, ich drucke es mal deutsch aus, soziale Organisation und Geschlechterbeziehungen in Melanesien und des Weiteren Religion und Symbolic Anthropology. Bei ihrer Forschung in Kenia, die ich kurz erwähnte, geht es um die Rolle junger Frauen, es geht um die Rolle von NGOs im Kontext von HIV und AIDS. Des Weiteren interessiert sie sich für die visuelle Repräsentation besonders des pazifischen Raums, der Pazifik Insulana, durch den Westen und letzte große Komplex, die zur Schaustellung nicht westlicher Objekte, nicht westlicher Kunst in Museen für moderne Kunst. Und damit bin ich beim Thema des heutigen Abends. Bitte begrüßen Sie ganz herzlich Frau Professor Lutgehaus. appreciate that uh, uh, you are listening to me 
in English, so I hope that I will be uh, clearly understood. But uh, I did gather from those remarks some of the things that uh, Eric Smith was saying, and I appreciate uh, all of the detail uh, of my uh, career heretofore. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions about James Cameron afterwards <laughs> if you're interested. Uh, but today, I'm going to put on my glasses and uh, talk about uh, From Artifact to Objet d'Art, a project that I began when I couldn't go back to New Guinea for a while uh, and spent some time at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles um, among art historians uh, and began to think about uh, how it was indeed that the same object that uh, at one point in time was considered an ethnographic artifact was transformed into an art object. Uh, so let me start by saying that a little more than a month ago in Paris, a group of Native Americans and their allies organized a protest. I never believe that the images really come up. I see them differently here. Uh, outside the auction house of Nare, Minet, Tessier, and Saru, in support of the Hopi Nation and its leadership, who were objecting to the impending sale of 70 sacred Hopi Indian masks. Perhaps you are aware of this water drink. Uh, as many of you know, the Hopi, a Native American culture, are an agricultural people who live on mesas or large rock outcroppings in an arid expanse of northern Arizona. The New York Times reported that the contested auction, quote, generated more than one million in sales. I didn't convert that to uh, euros. The rest of my figures are in euro. So we say about 70 million euros, perhaps. Uh, despite the presence of protesters inside and outside the auction house who urged patrons not to take part. One item in particular, a headdress known as the Crow Mother, drew the most intense interest. According to the Times, bidding on this 1880s artifact, which had a high estimate at the auction house of 56,000 euros, soared to 147,000 euros, drawing applause from a crowd of some 200 people in the sales room and a protest from a woman who stood up and shouted, don't purchase that, it's a sacred being. However, despite the help of a French lawyer acting on behalf of the Hopi, an hour, a few hours before the sale, a Paris municipal court judge ruled that the auction could go forward, finding that the mask-like objects, despite their divine status among the Hopi, could not be likened to dead or alive beings. The lawyer for the Hopi had argued that since the Hopi believed that the works embody living spirits, it was therefore immoral under French law to sell them. The Hopi had also said that the artifacts, known as kitsanen, or friends, were stolen from tribal lands in Arizona. The auction house, on the other hand, has said that a French collector obtained them legally decades ago, because many of these objects uh, are more than a century old. In a statement presented to the judge, the Hopi tribal chairman, Leroy Shingoitewa, noted, given the importance of these ceremonial objects to Hopi religion, you can understand why Hopis regard this, or any sale, as sacrilege, and why we regard an auction not as homage, but as a desecration of our religion. His mention of the term homage was a direct reference to a statement from the auction house that had suggested that the sale of the object should be regarded as an homage to the Hopi and their culture. 
I guess what he meant by this was that uh, because of the high price, perhaps, that these objects were uh, garnering. Uh, aware of the contentious nature of the sale, before starting it, the auctioneer told the crowd not only that a judge had found it to be perfectly legal, but that the objects were no longer sacred and that they had become important works of art. He added, that in France, you cannot just up and seize the property of a person that is lawfully his. Highlighting the impact of the sale of the objects for present-day Hopi, the New York Times quoted a Hopi tribe member and university exchange student in Paris who attended the auction. He said that the atmosphere inside the auction house was, for him, very surreal and heartbreaking. They, referring to the masks, he said, are truly sacred to us. We feed and we care for them. And to see people walking out with them in bags, like some object, I really felt helpless and hurt. The auction of the Hopi masks and the various statements made by the participants in the event make very explicit that the issue of the transformation of cultural artifacts into art and ultimately, in this case, into commodity, is not merely a subject of moribund academic discourse, but a topic that is still both very real in terms of the emotions it arouses and the economic and moral issues at play, and still very contentious. It involves issues of religion and sacred patrimony, the clash of cultures, private property and the law, as well as who has the right to declare when an object is no longer sacred, and to whom, and when it has become an important work of art. In this recent event in Paris, we see in action what the French social theorist Pierre Bourdieu identified as a field of cultural production. According to Bourdieu, in order for one to fully understand a cultural object, anything such as a painting or a novel, or in this case, a Hopi mask, as an art object, one must not only understand the cultural and historical development of the producers of the object, but also the social structure of the context of the, or field itself. In this case, the larger capitalist world of important art and art auctions which involves not only auction houses and art galleries, but art critics and academics, lawyers, journalists, and the public, as well as the Hopi themselves and their religious leaders. In this particular case, the representatives of the Hopi nation and their allies, this included individuals such as the actor Robert Redford, and groups such as Survival International, also tried to engage the United States government on behalf of the Hopi thus attempting to bring international politics into play as well. Although the masks put up for sale are objects that the Hopi classify as supernatural beings and were originally produced by the Hopi for use in their religious rituals, with the passage of time, it was said that their original French owner had purchased them directly from the Hopi in the 1930s. Uh, they'd been removed from their original context and transported to France, where they'd become embedded in a very different set of social relations, relations that led to them being classified as important art, and equally important as private property and commodities. So this new network of social relations represents a very different set of power dynamics than those within which the masks had operated as kitsaman. Thus, one of my objectives in the series of lectures that I'll be presenting over the course of the next seven weeks is to delineate the cultural history of the development of new kinds of social relations that led to the emergence of the category primitive art as a new field of cultural production. One that I will argue is intrinsically part of Western colonialism and the capitalist mode of production. But another important aspect of Bourdieu's theory of the cultural field is that it's based on a particular form of belief concerning what constitutes a cultural work 
and its aesthetic or social value. So in contrast to those philosophers of art like Kant, uh, who ascribed uh, an essentialist notion of the absolute value of such work in terms of the existence of universal aesthetic criteria, Bourdieu argues that aesthetic value itself is socially constituted and radically contingent on a very complex and constantly changing set of circumstances that involves multiple social and institutional factors. Following Bourdieu's theory of the field of cultural production and its call for in-depth historical and social structural contextualization, I will also contextualize the historical, cultural, and social processes that have contributed to the transformation of Western beliefs such that objects that once considered in the West solely to be the purview of ethnographic artifacts are now believed to be belong into the category of important art. Now, some of you may think that this subject has already been fully uh, uh, and adequately covered by other scholars, in particular by art historians interested first in the role of primitivism in modern art and then, more recently, by art historians interested in the field of African and Native American art. However, I intend to argue that what has thus far been missing from these analyses has been adequate attention to the role that anthropology and anthropologists have played in this transformation, especially during the 20th century, decades after modern artists such as Picasso and Nolde first noticed masks from Africa and sculptures from Oceania in ethnographic museums in Paris and Berlin. But before I leave the topic of the auction of the Hopi masks, I want to point out one last detail of that event. The auction house said that one of the artifacts, this one here, called a mud mask, was purchased for $3,430, considerably less than the other object that I showed you by a foundation that intends to return it to the tribe. In this gesture of repatriation, we see another aspect of the struggle between indigenous people and their claims to their patrimony versus the claims of the art market. That is, repatriation through the art market system itself. Buying back a mask, removing it from the category of art and commodity, and allowing it to return to its origins as a sacred object. In this action, as well as the fact that the auction went ahead despite the wishes of the Hopi, we see another dimension of the field of cultural production. And this is the position of the original producers of the art object within what Bourdieu calls a field of power. That is, the set of dominant power relations within society So in this case, the uh, power that the ruling class holds over and above the Hopi. Thus, at present, the Hopi as a people and their kitsaman as art objects occupy a subordinate or dominated position within this field of power, Uh, a field whose principle of legitimacy is based on the possession of economic and political capital, uh, in this case, too, legal capital. However, and this is an important point of what I want to make here, it's still important to recognize that the Hopi and their masks are situated within this field of power. They occupy a position within it because they possess a high degree of what Bourdieu has identified as symbolic capital. The concept of symbolic capital is one of Bourdieu's most important contributions to contemporary social theory complicating what otherwise might be considered simply a form of Marxist reductionist theory, with everything being reduced then to these economic, uh, its economic value. Bourdieu, however, understood that not all human endeavors can be evaluated in terms of economic value alone. Symbolic forms of capital include prestige, celebrity, the consecration of honor. Equally important is symbolic capital, with regard to the field of cultural production is another term that Bourdieu introduces of cultural capital. That is, forms of cultural knowledge, competence, dispositions, 
Or do you suggest that a work of art has meaning and interest only for someone who possesses the cultural competence, that is, the code into which it is encoded? The possession of this code and of cultural capital in general is accumulated through a long process of acquisition or inculcation and includes such things as family education, formal education, class education. We could say then that Robert Redford in this instance was activating his symbolic capital on behalf of the Hopi while the Hopi were attempting to utilize their cultural capital. However, the field of power at work in this case, which is the French legal system and the auction house, dominated these other sets of social relations and their lesser forms of capital. There's one other recent example uh, of the role of what used to be called primitive art in the wider field of cultural production that occurred in my home state of California that also caught the attention of the media last month. In San Francisco at the de Young Museum, and here you see a picture of that museum, uh, which is one of the city's mun municipal art museums, they announced that they intended to de-accession several pieces from the museum's Jolica collection, an outstanding collection of art from Oceania, donated recently to the museum by John and Marcia Friedi, wealthy collectors who live outside of New York City. I had the opportunity uh, to visit John Friedi at his home in Rye, New York, to see his collection prior to him donating it to the de Young Museum. And I have also lectured to docents at the de Young about the uh, Jolica collection. Um, so here we see it in his home. Um, although Friedi began to collect oceanic art relatively recently, only within the past 30 years or so, uh, within that period he had the means as well as the opportunity to amass a superlative collection of over 4,000 objects, in part through his close association with Douglas Newton, who was the former director of the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Departments of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. And indeed, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, the, Friedi's decision to donate his collection to the de Young Museum rather than to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he'd already endowed the John Friedi Chair in the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, surprised many people um, in the art world. So what we see at work here, both with um, uh, Friedi's decision as to where his collection was going to go and the museum's decision then to deaccession some of his uh, objects against his will um, is the sometimes tenuous as well as tense relationship between museum curators, museum trustees, and art collectors. For Friedi, who is an heir through his mother uh, to some of the vast Walter Annenberg fortune. Uh, this is money that was accumulated through Annenberg's business acumen in the fields of media and communication. Uh, he um, created the TV Guide, uh, among other communication um, publications. Collecting was both a family tradition and a form of symbolic capital. However, as others have pointed out, Museums and individual collectors often have different goals with regard to the same objects, even though they are actors within the same field of cultural production. Museums are a quintessentially Western cultural institution with their own history of development that has played an important role in the field of cultural production and, most germane to our focus, to the process of the transformation of non-Western objects from the categories of artifact to objet d'art. Thus, another theme that's going to run throughout my lectures is the development of museums in the West and the history of their collection and display of non-Western objects. And it's this last uh, topic, the display of non-Western objects, that I'll be uh, talking about in some detail. Lest my discussion of Bourdieu's idea of the field of cultural production 
lead you to think that I'm only interested in presenting a sociological analysis of the process whereby ethnographic artifacts become objects of art, and given the development of modern capitalism, their transformation into commodities, I want to introduce another theoretical perspective concerned with the anthropology of art that adds a dimension of complexity to this process. It's a theory developed by the late British anthropologist Alfred Jell in his book, Art and Agency. And I find it particularly useful precisely because its focus is on the art object itself. Now, rather than being in opposition to Bourdieu's theory of cultural production, Jell's theory is complementary to it. Both theorists, for example, argue against the Kantian position of aesthetics as a human universal. Both argue for understanding art as the product of a complex set of social relations that entails not only the object itself and the individual who has produced it, but also other relations, such as who the object was made for, who will see the object, and who will have a say in evaluating or classifying the object. However, Jell allows us to develop an anthropological approach to the question of what is art in general through his interest in understanding what he considers to be the seductive power of art. He understands art as a form of instrumental action. That is, art involves the making of things as a form of, in, uh, as a means of influencing the thoughts and actions of others. So art is supposed to uh, have an effect on the viewer. Art objects, according to Jell, embody complex intentionalities and they mediate social agency. Persons and objects merge together in his conceptualization. In an earlier paper that he wrote called The Technology of Enchantment and the Enchantment of Technology, Jell sought to answer the question why modern social anthropologists, at least in his case, the British variety, had so assiduously neglected the study of art. Unlike some of the earliest anthropologists, such as Hatton, Pitt Rivers, Tyler, Fraser, to go back in the uh, canon of British anthropologists, Franz Boas and his students in the United States, Bastian Frobenius and Lucien in Germany, who had been interested in the topic of art albeit most often within an evolutionary framework. From Malinowski and Radcliffe Brown on, Jell observed, social anthropologists have studied politics, they've studied economics, they've studied social organization, religion, kinship, but few had studied art. He suggested, somewhat surprisingly to us perhaps, that the answer was because anthropologists were anti-art. He was quick to say that he didn't mean by this statement that they advocated blowing up the Tate or the National Gallery, but rather that they recognized that the Western attitude toward art was an unredeemably ethnocentric attitude, no matter how laudable it might be in other respects. Our value system, he said, dictates that unless we're Philistines, we should attribute value to a culturally recognized category of art objects. However, anthropologists also realized that even though by the mid-1980s when he was writing this article, the objects in question derived from many different cultures, Westerners now passed effortlessly from the contemplation of a Tahitian sculpture to one by Bram Cousy, nonetheless, this attitude of asceticism was still uh, aestheticism, was still culture bound and not recognized by all cultures. In order for anthropologists to dispassionately engage in the anthropological study of art, they would also have to practice what he referred to as methodological philistinism, as the ultimate aim of this study would be the dissolution of art. In other words, the reduction of art to something else, something other than an enduring universal. And according to Jell, 
the assumption of the stance of methodological philistinism had been difficult for many, and thus they'd simply avoided the topic of study. Well, some of you may be thinking it's been quite some time, almost 30 years since Jell wrote this article, and things have changed within anthropology. Uh, and there are and have been uh, today, in part thanks to the work of anthropologists such as Jell, proliferation of books and articles and conferences focused on the anthropological study of art. And uh, for instance, in 1984, a year before Jell presented his ideas about art as a technology of enchantment, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City organized a now infamous ex exhibition called Primitivism. Oops, I was going to show you a little bit more of the Jolica collection of the de Jong, so let me go through these quickly first. This is just to give you some idea of what had been uh, in that collection um, in San Francisco. These are all objects from uh, the part of New Guinea, um, the area of the world that I worked in, Monum Island and the North Coast that uh, uh, you heard about earlier. Uh, so here you can get some idea of um, what this collection um, is like. And here is what I wanted to show you. The catalog from the Primitivism exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, it was subtitled, Affinities of the Tribal and the Modern. This exhibition generated a vociferous critical outcry from anthropologists as well as others interested in the topic of primitive art and primitivism, this latter being defined as an interest in things primitive. Beginning with the provocative volume, Art Artifact, which was published in 1988, a collection of essays by anthropologists and art historians interested in the display of African art, along with Sally Price's Primitive Art in Civilized Places, an early study by an anthropologist that looked at the inclusion of non-Western tribal art in museums of fine art, both art historians and anthropologists have begun to reconsider the relationship between these two disciplines. And in many cases, though, the dialogue still revolves around the question of whether aesthetics is a cross-cultural category, or, put this another way, whether art is a universal found in all societies, past and present. Some of the anthropological contributions to this dialogue have included Jeremy Coote and Anthony Sheldon's collection, Anthropology, Art, and Aesthetics, published in 1992, Fred Myers and George Marcus's The Traffic in Culture, Refiguring Art and Anthropology from 1995, and more recently, Howard Morphy's Becoming Art, Exploring Cross-Cultural Categories. That was published in 2007. A second focus of anthropological inquiry has been the relationship between material culture cross-cultural exchange, and colonialism, with works by Nicholas Thomas, such as Entangled Objects, Exchange, Material Culture, and Colonialism in the Pacific, and a volume he edited with Diane Loesch titled Double Vision, Art Histories and Colonial Histories in the Pacific. Yet another development has been the anthropological study of new genres of non-Western art, books such as Fred Meyer's Painting Culture, the making of an aboriginal high culture, his ethnography about the origins of aboriginal acrylic paintings, and Shelley Arrington's The Death of Authentic Primitive Art and Other Tales of Progress, with its focus on the development of tourist and ethnic art. Finally, there's also been an efflorescence of new interdisciplinary journals that focus on the study of objects, whether considered art objects or not, publications such as Material Culture, Material Religion, Visual Culture, and the Visual Anthropology Review, to name just a few, and with a primarily American bias there, American and English bias. Having given a quick and very partial overview of the expansive growth in, the recent, in recent decades in the anthropological study of art, I want to return to Jell's article and discuss in more detail why he thought anthropologists had avoided the study of art. <clears throat> 
because I think it gives us insight into two important phenomena related to what I'll be talking about during uh, this series of lectures. First of all, his discussion highlights the ethnocentricity of our Western culture's definitions of an attitude towards the category of art, thus helping us to understand um, that it is simply one in a series of Western categories concerned with material objects. Others that I'll be discussing include artificial curiosities, curios, idols, ethnographica, artifacts, commodities, and even firewood. Second, it helps us to understand Jell's cross-cultural definition of art, which he suggests should be viewed, as I said earlier, as a technology of enchantment. In explicating what he means by this concept, that is, the production of objects by humans for a particular purpose, to enchant or dazzle people, he places himself in that category of scholars concerned with the defining art who do not see aesthetics, and again, I had said this earlier, as a human universal. He does, however, see art as a cultural product, something that all humans produce, that is recognized and appreciated in all cultures, despite the fact that not all cultures have a specific term for it. Jell begins his discussion with a focus on the topic of aesthetics in order to define the study of aesthetics as distinct from the study of art. In order to do so, he presents an analogy between the anthropological study of religion and the anthropological study of art. I'm going to belabor this distinction a little bit because uh, one of the things I was told that the Jensen uh, lectures uh, often focus on is religion. And since uh, in the next week's uh, lectures, I will be talking some about religion, but beyond that, it will uh, become less and less important. So I thought that Jell's um, analogy uh, might set the stage for uh, a focus that's going to be more on art than religion. So. Jell continued, when an anthropologist approaches the study of religion in another culture, no matter whether he or she is a believer of a particular faith or an atheist, in order to understand that other religion, the anthropologist needs to approach it from the stance of a methodological atheist, an, obje an objective observer who does not believe in the truth value of that culture's religion. Only by means of this outsider point of view can the researcher understand the relationship between a culture's set of religious beliefs and practices and other aspects of the society? A religion's dogma, its beliefs, values, underlying principles and practices constitute what we call a religion's theology and its ethics, its ideas of what is good and true. Jell points out that because both ethics and aesthetics are concerned with notions of what is good and true, they are often considered to occupy the same epistemological category. This conceptual similarity leads him to suggest that the study of aesthetics is to the domain of art the same as the study of theology is to the study of religion. That is to say, that aesthetics is a branch of moral discourse which depends upon the acceptance of the initial article of faith, that in the aesthetically valued object, there resides the principle of the true and the good, and the study of the aesthetically uh, valued object constitutes a path towards transcendence. Having laid out this idea of aesthetics as a branch of moral discourse, he goes on to suggest that for many individuals in our secular age, including anthropologists, insofar as they possess a religion, that religion is the religion of art. It is a religion whose shrines and temples consist of museums and galleries, theaters, orchestral halls, and libraries. The priests of this religion are painters, playwrights, poets, and its theologians, the critics. 
Its dogma is the dogma of universal aestheticism. Following a similar line of thought, in her book Civilizing Rituals Inside Public Art Museums, the art historian Carol Duncan has suggested that the behavior typically expected and often observed of people in a public art museum in either Europe or the United States is behavior traditionally associated with sacred spaces, such as temples and churches, and that one of the functions of Western museums has been to civilize the general public. In order for anthropologists to adopt a stance of methodological um, uh, atheism or philistinism, Jell suggests that they consider art, whether painting, sculpture, music, dance, poetry, oral literature, novels, stories, to be a component of a technology system. So this goes back to why he's uh, insisting on art as a technology uh, of enchantment. Whoops, wrong way. Here we go. Uh, from this perspective, uh, and a component of a technology system, um, and a system that is essential to the reproduction of human societies. So this is where he begins to talk about the fact that all societies have uh, produce art. From this perspective, any art object is a product of a particular technical process. And some individuals are, therefore, more skilled at particular techniques than others. Moreover, as I've already stressed, he further suggests that art is a product, product whose purpose is enchantment. Uh, however, Jell also notes that this concept of art, like other sociological theories of art, loses focus on the material object itself and how it functions as a technology of enchantment. The object he uses to demonstrate his theory is the object that you see in this image here, a Trobriand Island canoe splashboard. It's an intricately carved and decorated painted wooden board that is affixed to a seagoing canoe. Here you'll see in this image where the splashboard and the prow of the canoe um, are attached. Uh, and this is affixed, these two items are affixed to a canoe. So here we have a Trobrian um, seagoing canoe, the type that Trobrian Island men used in the Kula Exchange expeditions that were first described by Malinowski in Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Um, I've been to the Trobrian Islands myself and I've purchased such a canoe uh, splashboard. So I have proof that these items have become commodities uh, in the sphere of tourist exchange, but that they also still function locally as important items men use to adorn their Kula canoes. And here, I'll just give you an idea of the variety that you see in these different uh, canoe prows. Um, the one with the white background in the lower, uh, this is the one that I purchased. Uh, Jell goes on to say, uh, almost par paradoxically, that an art object functions as a means of enchantment as a result of the enchantment of technology. And he's not just being clever here with his uh, use of uh, terms, um, but what exactly does he mean uh, by this seemingly paradoxical statement? And how does his theory of art help us to understand the Western transformation of non-Western artifacts in fine art. According to Jell, the purpose of placing a finely decorated canoe prow and splashboard on a Kula canoe is to overwhelm one's Kula partner when a Trobrian Islander arrives on another island. That is, to literally dazzle the beholder and thus loosen his grip on himself, causing him to be more generous uh, with his coolie gifts than he might otherwise have been. Uh, but how exactly does the canoe prow and splashboard do this? Jell dismisses, excuse me, the idea that uh, one might call an ethological explanation 
one that's based on the physiology of the eye, uh, that, the, um, that there's actually uh, something um, that the eye is reacting to within the, uh, what he calls the eye spot aspect of these designs. He says, that's not what he's talking about. Um, he argues that it's the beholder, uh, it's that the beholder interprets his reaction uh, to the design of the prow as evidence of the magical power emanating from the board. So in order to get at this explanation, you would need to be able to talk with the Trobrian Islanders about their reactions to these uh, designs. It's this magical power which may deprive the spectator of his reason, leading him to be more generous with his gifts than he might otherwise have been. Thus, according to Gell, what is most important is that a particularly impressive canoe splashboard is interpreted to be a physical token of magical prowess on the part of the owner of the canoe, and that this recognition is coupled with the fact that he, the owner of the canoe, has access to the service of a carver whose artistic prowess is also the result of his access to superior carving magic. Now, lest you think that this theory of gels only you know, applies to uh, objects, non-Western objects, gel presents two other examples from Western art that represent two very different periods of time and artistic styles and genre. So the first one is this image from 19th century American artist named John Petto. Petto. Uh, and this uh, painting is titled Old Time Letter Rack. And it's impressed countless viewers since it was painted in 1894 with its technical vers virtuosity. And a sense of what Jell calls the true artist as an occult technician. So in other words, what uh, viewers of this picture uh, are often impressed with is its reality, how realistic it is that people want to go up and actually touch the uh, objects. Um, on the other hand, he gives another example, Picasso's 1950 sculpture titled Baboon and Young, which far from being an example of realistic technique, has also impressed and delighted hundreds of viewers because of its clever and humorous transformation of one object, the toy car, you see up here, into another, the representation of a baboon's face. Again, Picasso's work, Gell says, directs our attention to the essential alchemy of art. We can now see, I hope, how Gell's approach to art objects as examples of technologies of enchantment can have cross-cultural application. But let us return to the consideration of the Trobrian splashboard uh, and how it became an object of art from a Western perspective. This transformation entailed at least two significant processes, one practical and the other ideological. The first entailed someone physically obtaining the Trobrian splashboard and then transporting it from New Guinea to Europe. Somehow that object had to get here. The second, I would say, is a precondition for the first. That required that there was someone in Europe who was interested in having a Trobrian splashboard here hardly a utilitarian item that some European fishermen or sportsmen would be interested in. Although I'll be talking about this historical process in more detail in uh, week three, um, with regard to the ideological impetus, it's useful to reflect briefly on a distinction first made by Walter Benjamin in his now classic article, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, in which he noted that works of art are received and valued on different planes, in which two polar types stand out. 
With one, he said, the accent is on the cult value. With the other, the exhibition value of the work. He was referring here to two different historical periods in which a work of art in prehistoric uh, times was valued purely for its cult value. He used the term prehistoric uh, as it was first and foremost an instrument of magic. Only later did it come to be recognized as a work of art, placed on exhibit and enjoyed for its own sake. These two forms of valuation, cult versus exhibition, can be seen to apply to the Trobrian splashboard as it moved from its original context as part of a Trobrian hula canoe to its new context as an example of primitive art from the Masim region of New Guinea. <coughs> However, Benjamin's formulation of the value of a work of art is only part of the story when we're considering the transformation of objects of so-called primitive art. What's missing I would suggest, in Benamin's description, is yet another plane of valuation, that of the object's scientific value. For before our Trobrian splashboard became valued in the West as an object of art with exhibitionary value, it was first valued as an object with scientific value. And here, of course, is where the anthropologists come in. They first valued the Trobrian splashboard and other non-Western objects, as a specimen, a piece of material evidence, useful in terms of explanatory value in an evolutionary narrative being developed by anthropologists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In an article titled Curios and Curiosity, notes on reading Torde and Frobenius, the anthropologist Johannes Fabian has given considerable thought to the role that collecting objects as practiced by 19th century European scientists, especially anthropologists, has played in the development of Western ethnographic knowledge. His insights into the development, into the Western practice of collecting non-Western objects provides us with a useful theoretical link between theorizing about objects as art in one location and understanding how these same objects, which were not considered to be art in another location, came to be desired in the West. What interests me most about Fabian's uh, article is his premise that there's a way of showing the importance of object collection almost deductively as deriving from the logic that governed exploration and early ethnography. By this he means that the very exigencies of traveling and working among non-Western peoples, in Frobenius' case, of course, in Africa, often meant that Westerners had no choice but to exchange goods uh, for objects Africans had in order, among other things, to establish and maintain crucial social relations. Only secondarily, Fabian suggests, did these objects become desired not for their prospects of profit, but rather because they were good to think. Here, Fabian's evoking Levi Strauss's famous phrase with re uh, reference to totemism and myth. Thus, in his analysis of 19th century anthropological expeditions, Fabian presents us with, a mo with an important description of what the historian James Clifford has called a taxonomic moment, a point in time when what had heretofore been simply considered curios by most Westerners became transformed, at least from the perspective uh, of anthropologists, as ethnographica or ethnographic artifacts with scientific value. Um, Clifford then, uh, in talking about this idea of a taxonomic moment, um, ref uh, suggested that the exhibition that I showed you, the uh, art in um, primitivism in 20th century uh, America, 20th century modern art, um, also be considered another taxonomic moment, a moment when the status of non-Western objects and high art are importantly redefined. Um, and while um, 
Clifford himself is not talking about the exhibition uh, as an art object. One of the things that I'm going to be talking about later is the way in which I think we can look at exhibitions themselves as a particular type of art object that uh, can be analyzed. Uh, referring to Jean Baudrillard, another French social theory theorist who, like Bourdieu, saw the meaning and value of objects as being conferred on them by social actors, individuals who do so from positions of power within a system of objects, Clifford reminds us that there's nothing permanent or transcendent about these categories. In fact, as he pointed out with regard to the exhibit, uh, the 1984 MoMA exhibit, uh, modernist primitivism, with its claim to deeper humanist sympathies and a wider aesthetic sense, goes hand in hand with a developed market in tribal art and with definitions of artistic and cultural authenticity that are now, he was writing in the 1980s, widely contested. So another, uh, like Clifford, I'm going to wear the hat of a cultural or his intellectual historian and present a history of this changing taxonomy. However, I'm going to do so primarily from the perspective of institutions and individuals in the United States. My reasons for taking this perspective are twofold. First of all, this historical and geographic vantage point corresponds to a period of history that I experienced firsthand in New York, roughly the years 1970 to 1985, through my acquaintance with Douglas Newton, a curator of oceanic art, whose name I mentioned earlier. Uh, he was first a curator at the Museum of Primitive Art and then at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'll also be referring to my work at the American Museum of Natural History uh, and my ethnographic research in the Sepik region of Papua New Guinea. During this time, while I was in New York at Columbia University, I was a participant and an observer of aspects of a process that anthropologist Shelley Arrington has labeled the demise of the golden age of authentic primitive art. The so-called golden age, she says, was at its height in the United States between 1957 and 1972. That period ended, according to Arrington, in 1982 with the opening of the Michael Rockefeller Wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was de dedicated solely to this display of primitive art. In the lectures that follow, I'll draw upon my firsthand knowledge of these, the key participants and events, as well as archival research that I've done uh, on the history of the Museum of Primitive Art, an institution that Jacques Kirkash, the first director of the Musée de Quai Branly in Paris, noted was unique for its time in its focus on primitive art and its transformation. Then I'll be talking about the transformation of that museum into the Michael Rockefeller wing. Um, secondly, uh, I'm going to be focusing on the United States and this uh, uh, history because it demonstrates so clearly the social relations that contributed to the creation of primitive art as a field of cultural production in the United States, a cultural field in which the main participants had many social and institutional relationships with Europe. Um, in this respect, I think that it's possible to consider both the period between 1957 and 72 and the period between 1972 and the mid-1980s as representing what Clifford, in a different context, has identified as chronotopes. Here he's using Bakhtin's term uh, to denote um, a configuration of special and temporal indicators in a fictional setting. Uh, so Bakhtin used this term in a fictional setting where certain activities and stories take place Clifford suggesting we can use the same term uh, in, when we look at uh, history, uh, real events, uh, and I find it very useful in uh, talking about what is particularly going on in different um, historic moments. Uh, again, Clifford used this term chronotope, uh, which for a term uh, chronotope of collecting, uh, and again, he was using the term in reference to the time period that the um, Museum of Modern Arts exhibit was focusing on. 
um, the 19, early uh, teens and 20s uh, in Europe primarily. He was preferring, but then um, Clifford goes on to refer to a period of time in New York during the Second World War as a time and place when modern art and culture collecting, you can re-substitute uh, more specifically primitive art, collided. Uh, in particular, expatriates such as surrealist André Breton and anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, refugees from fascist Europe, found themselves afforded the opportunity to collect Native American artifacts, often in exchange for modern art. So, um, while the period of time that's focused on in this MoMA exhibit uh, was an earlier period in Europe, um, Clifford is uh, talking about a subsequent period of time in the United States. And this is where this, uh, the field of um, activity in terms of looking at the definition of primitive art shifts from what was going on in Europe to the United States, which again is why I'm interested in focusing on uh, the United States. Um, in this case at hand, the two chronotopes I'm, considered, I'm concerned with represent these two specific periods in the United States that contributed to the redefinition of non-Western objects as primitive art. Um, in this respect, they could be called chronotopes for transformation. Um, aficionados of primitive art have long asserted that the term primitive art does not mean that art is crude or rough, and by the middle of the 20th century, Westerners were no longer saying the people who made, quote unquote, primitive art were prim primitive themselves. As anthropologists had taught them that non-Western societies were often very sophisticated in terms of their social structures, their languages, and thought. So in 1978, in the preface to a book titled Masterpieces of Primitive Art, the collection of Nelson Rockefeller, so you see, the term primitive art was still being used in 78, um, but the people who made the art were not considered to be primitive. Um, Douglas Newton, the newly appointed curator of what was then called the Department of Primitive Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, wrote that primitive art, quote, encompasses the art of those peoples who have remained until recent times at an early technological level who have been oriented towards the use of tools, but not machines. He went on to observe that once the term is accepted, we can see immediately that it comprises an enormous proportion of the world's surface and its po past populations. One begins to see, faced with the image of this expanse, that primitive culture, considered in its true perspective, is perhaps the major part of human experience over the world's surface. The aesthetic significance of primitive art is correspondingly great. So this was the um, explanation that was being given for why this art would be incorporated um, into the Metropolitan Museum. Um, I'm going to uh, jump uh, to closer to the end of my uh, talk. Um, and just um, end with um, uh, this image. In 1954, the French filmmakers, Chris Marker and Alain René, were asked to make a film about non-Western art in the collections of French museums in Paris. This assignment so moved them, seeing so many foreign objects removed from their original context and placed on display far from their native homes, that they titled their film Les Statues Meurent Aussi, Statues Also Die. The film might seem a fitting companion to Shelley Arrington's argument in her book Concerning the Death of Authentic Primitive Art. For both the film and Arrington's book are critiques of the effects of colonialism on the one hand and capitalism and globalization on the other, on non-Western objects. There's another perspective, however, from which we can consider Arrington's pronouncement 
of the death of the category of primitive art. Thus, for example, what began in 1982 as the Department of Primitive Art at the Metropolitan Museum is now today called the Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. This change in nomenclature reflects a general change that began first in academia and is now followed more generally by the public at large. The recognition that the term primitive was both demeaning and inaccurate as a description of vast numbers of people who live in rural and urban communities in the third world or developing countries. Again, terms that are problematic and reflect the general problem that uh, previously underlay the term primitive. What we used to call primitive art is now recognized to be historical antecedents to today's arts from specific African, Oceanic, and North, South, and Mesoamerican cultures. However, I'm getting ahead of myself here as what I'll be focusing on over the course of the next six lectures is what I'm calling the prehistory of primitive art and the role of anthropologists in both the creation of the category primitive art and its demise. Uh, so I'm going to be, uh, as I said, presenting what I am calling the prehistory of primitive art, which is a kind of taxonomic history. And I think just very briefly, um, I'll end by uh, giving you um, just some sense of what these uh, next six lectures will cover. So um, the next uh, lecture will be on Melanesian rituals and Melanesian art. And um, I had long descriptions about what I was going to cover in each of these sections that I'm going to skip. So I'll just show you some pictures, and we'll go on to the next. Uh, I will be looking at art from New Ireland, from the Sepik region, and the Osmot. Uh, I will also, uh, the, the following week, week three, be talking about from artificial curiosities to ethnographica, looking at cabinets of curiosity, looking at uh, explorers and their collections, looking at the uh, destruction of many of these um, items by missionaries, and last but not least, the creation of ethnographic museums. Uh, primitivism and modern art in the 1920s and 30s, a topic that has been uh, written about uh, by many. Uh, so instead of focusing on uh, artists such as the Dada here on a hook, uh, I'm going to be taking you to the United States and looking at the 1930s and in particular the work of a Mexican uh, artist named um, Miguel Covarrubias, who was also an anthropologist. He worked in Bali as well as Mexico. Uh, we're then in the following week, this brings us up to week uh, five, going to be looking at the um, Curatorial work of a man named René Darnancourt, who happened to be the director of the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York, but he also um, curated all of the museums, most uh, of all of the museums, uh, exhibits that had to do with non-Western art. So I'm going to be looking at the Museum of Modern Art from the context of the exhibits on non-Western art that were presented there, such as this one on Indian art in 1941, and another that he did on the arts of the South Seas in 1946. Uh, we're then going to be looking at Nelson Rockefeller, who uh, has been called the Bowerbird of Collectors. Uh, and his um, creation of the Museum of Primitive Art that I've referred to in, that was, uh, occurred in 1957. And then finally, we're going to be looking at uh, what uh, led the Metropolitan Museum of Art to go primitive, as I said, to create a department of primitive art. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about where um, non-Western art is uh, today with some examples of um, work that's being done by some people who I find doing interesting work coming out of uh, Australia and um, other parts of the Pacific. So there's a heavy, heavy emphasis on the Pacific again. Uh, this is the part of the world that I'm most familiar with. 
Uh, there'll be some comparative work in terms of Africa uh, and uh, Native America as well. So I thank you for um, bearing with me through uh, this long uh, discussion in uh, English, and I'm certainly welcome to answering any questions that you might have. Thank you.